I think Trump, there's a bigger chance of Trump ending that catastrophe in Ukraine than there is with Kamala. And for me, that yeah. was another thing like, OK, go on, let, let's just see what Trump does. I think what Trump does with tariffs is going to be like the most significant thing he does in his first year. <laughs> Did you watch the election? So we, we stayed up to watch election night. Oh, I didn't stay up to watch it, but I saw the results uh, the next day, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. How did you well, feel? How are you feeling? Yeah. Uh, like, yeah, I'm uh, curious about what you think. So I'd, I'd love to hear what you part? were thinking and feeling, but I'll, I'll start then. I was I was actually yeah. quite happy. I'm. I just want to be clear. Like I used to. I was for a long time. I've been a Democrat. So I like when Obama was uh, when Obama was running. I supported Obama. You know. But I was actually quite happy when Trump won because I felt like it was a massive F you to the Democrats who, for me, were just. I don't I feel like. Can you actually give me a single thing that you rate about Kamala Harris? Hey, like, this is the problem, isn't it? Like, looking back. I don't, it, but like, it seems Kamala like it's high, is, was so bad that I've and, actually become a Trump supporter. But like that's how bad she was, man. When I look at Trump, so I get that he's got his issues, but at, at least I can I can list a couple of strengths, okay? Like, at least he has that... Okay, he might not be the most seasoned politician, but at least there's an authenticity. To, so his, his campaigning was much better, for starters. Mm. Okay? Much more authentic. Wasn't afraid to come out and do long, drawn-out interviews, talk shows... Even if the talk shows were like in advance, kind of maybe going soft on him, fine. But at least he came out and did them. You know, Kamala, the most guarded politician I've ever seen. I can't name you a single positive attribute. She was going to, when they asked her, what would you do differently from Biden? She said, nothing comes to mind. Yeah, that um, was a bad answer, wasn't it? Look, both Kamala and Trump are bored. Like, they're, like, bored, but, like, Washington's got issues, man. That entire place, you go into Congress, they're all bought by either some bank or some uh, some military company or someone. Some lobby, yeah. And I get that there's a case to be made for that as well, by the way. So, apparently, the military-industrial complex provides a lot of jobs. And America is also a wartime economy, just nonstop. <laughs> like, and these weapons, by the end of the day, do provide people with protection, they provide us with a protection if we need it. I'm not saying it's all bad, but what I'm saying is Kamala was trying to make neoliberalism work in a time in which the, everything tells me that it's ended. So she was like carrying on, like, if Biden was the zombie, Kamala was like a wannabe zombie, like trying to support mm. a, a dead system as well. And she was just, I can't. I could go on and on and on about how disappointing she was as a candidate. And this is the thing. I feel like Trump won, not because I loved Trump, but because I was just so dis disillusioned with Kamala, who, I, and again, I, I've heard so many bad things about the, the Democrats, about how there are cases to be made about how they're pro-censorship as well. Some of that mm. might be venturing into the alt-right conspiracy territory, which I'm a bit wary of. But, you know, there's evidence that says that Zuckerberg was cozying up with Biden during the COVID thing. Um, again, I, look, everything has a but. So with COVID, maybe there is a case to be made for restricting free speech if the government is seriously trying to save lives. But it's just it's I just heard one dodgy thing about the Democrats after another. And it was nonstop, Alex. It, and the thing that really actually, you know, there are some reasons why I actually wanted to vote Trump. With Kamala, I think she would have just kept on kept the um, crisis in Ukraine going, where she's literally just going to go along with whatever. Because, you know, there's evidence of, I don't know, again, not getting into conspiracy here, but if you look at some of the stakes in Ukraine, because for a long time, sorry, I'm, I'm going on and on and on, and I'd love to get you to come in. But for a long time, I've been thinking, well, why is the United States involved in Ukraine? How are they benefiting from this war? There is the theory that the United States, Russia and China, uh, since the dawn of time till the end of time, will be in a kind of an everlasting war. Whether that be hot or cold, there will always be tensions mm -hmm. between these three because they're the big global powers with the most resources and the most manpower. And inevitably they will always be in some kind of conflict and the United States is just trying to fulfill its geopolitical prophecy there by taking Ukraine and, and telling Russia to basically F you. But there's more to it than that. Um, you know, I've heard 
I've heard that, you know, Black... So have you heard of a company called BlackRock, man? Mm. Right, Military so... Contractors. They've got <clears throat> contracts to rebuild that place. That's another thing, right? Then BlackRock has ties with the military industrial complex who always make profit when these kind of things happen so there's a lot of vested interest in war and maybe the united states is now pursuing a war at the expense of a tax fair pair but to help its rich patrons who kind of help it govern the world anyway now <laughs> Again, I'm not saying, I'm, I, and this might be about strangers, I'm not saying necessarily turn your back on that policy, but if it's coming at the expense of the United States, if it's damaging a lot of, if it, well, it's, obviously it's killing innocent lives in Ukraine, by the way. So that's one thing. But I know that the people high up in the in the establishment don't really factor that. You get some very amoral people in the higher echelons, I think. If it's just about profit, fine. But is it even profitable now? Like... And maybe for some wealthy people, it is. But I, I, it, it's if anything, it's just turning the global south, the, the the people who are not part of the West, surely this is just turning them against the United States and just accelerating the destruction of the neoliberal order. So, look, I had a lot there on my mind. I, I, and I, for me, just to finish, I think Trump, there's a bigger chance of Trump ending that catastrophe in Ukraine than there is with Kamala. And for me, that yeah. was another thing like, OK, go on, let, let's just see what Trump does. He might not, mm -hmm. but there's a, I just sense there's a, and all, one other thing with Trump. I'm actually a quite, ex, I'm more excited about Trump than I am Kamala. I'm much more excited because look at his team. You might, it could go catastrophe, like it could go really badly. Yeah, good, I think. Elon Musk, Chancellor of like managing efficiency, um, pulling in some new uh, uh, policies aimed at making the government more efficient by slashing it. It brings in that association with innovation. Elon Musk is at the peak of his powers right now. He's 53 years old, head of some companies, very, very well versed in AI. Can there be something there? Can he fuse these two government and the private sector to, I don't know, just make things better, more efficient? You've got Robert Kennedy Jr., who I know you're very critical of, but I've followed him for a long time. And I genuinely think he's trying to do some good things for the health sector there. And America has a massive issue over there. I've been there, man. I went there for a month. I put on five kilos in two months by eating the food in their supermarkets, man. Like, you know, Vivek Ramaswamy isn't quite as close to Trump as the other two, but I'm excited for him. He brings forth some really cool new ideas, man. And then J.D. Vance as well. This guy gets a lot of hate. And I don't know if Trump will be as isolationist as J.D. Vance maybe might want him to be. But again, there's a difference there. There's a challenging of the establishment who I believe has let America down for a long time. So... Mm. There is this, okay, I'm, I I just want to see what they do because I it, it can't be as bad as what Biden and Kamala did. And that's how I see it. Now, obviously, let me know. So when Trump came into power, what were your thoughts? What were your feelings? Would you, do you prefer him to Kamala? Let me know, man, because like, I want to yeah. know. It's interesting. I, I, I find myself agreeing with loads of what you say. And then I also feel like, I don't want Trump to be president, so right. So no, no, fair maybe enough. Maybe I need to examine my own like, biases. Well. Um, how did I feel? Not that surprised. Nowhere near as glum as twenty sixteen. Right. Um, I totally agree with you that like, um, Harris as a candidate wasn't very exciting, but no nah, man. I feel like that's become especially clear in retrospect. Like at the time, I was like, this looks like a close fought race. She, I they were like. The, the Democrats, like, what she was saying. She, she had to get the Democrats to come in and prop her up, man. She had to rely on people like Obama and Hillary Clinton and all these people to come and say, yeah, vote for Kamala. What kind of state are you in when you have to call in Hillary Clinton to help your campaign? I feel like it could be that Harris would always have been a crap candidate. Or it could have been that she was really uh, hamstrung and then did like a decent campaign considering... The like limitations placed upon her, but I t I agree. Like Trump, see, like... dude, she. <clears throat> I, I, I was surprised. Like, yeah, look, I guess she was kind of thrown into it, wasn't she? She didn't have much time to prepare. You kind of maybe even feel for her for a bit because of that. Mm. But like, does it? I mean, she. 
there was no substance at all. Like she actively avoided discussing policy. She actively avoided sharing anything. I'm, I'm like, mm. has it not even crossed your in your four years as vice president? Hasn't it crossed your mind what you would like to do? Surely at one point it must have. But no, like there was nothing there, man. Like, I can't also, believe it. <laughs> I feel like, I, honestly, like, I don't know if my brain's just playing tricks on me, but I'm pretty sure that um, Biden more than hinted that when he got elected, I'm not going to stand next election. That will be Kamala. Like, I think he basically said something along those lines four years ago in his election campaign. So it's weird that he didn't um, empower her to like have a really good record and platform and team around her and like policy unit to think of some really good policies. Because in the end, you're right. Like she offered nothing exciting for me. I would have voted for her maybe on the basis of, um, yeah, I just don't, I don't like Trump as a person. But I think he was the stronger candidate. I mean, yeah. do you agree he was the stronger yeah. candidate? Definitely. And um, I was watching, like, you know, it's easy to um, like dismiss all the MAGA crowd as, um, or the MAGA extreme crowd to go to his rallies at least. But I, I watched some, like, good journalism where they're interviewing, like, folks from, yeah, pretty rundown places and pretty um, challenged industries. And they were all Trump because they were like, it cost me more to fill up my car. It cost me more. I'm worried about um, my business shutting down or my my career. I don't have an alternate career, so if Ooh. this one goes to pot, and that little bit more that they trumped, uh, they trusted Trump on the economy. I think did a like had a big uh, sway in the election. And to be fair, it's I, so easy to dismiss these people. Like as oh, they're just like rednecks. Oh, like no man, mm. like they're still people. Like your your vote still depends on these people. Believe it or not. I mean, look. Oh, I could go in so many different angles. To what extent is America still a democracy? Is, is it self debatable? There was a paper issued by, I think it was Princeton or Harvard, or yeah, it was by a leading university. It was either Princeton, Harvard, or Yale, one of them. Mm. Uh, and the paper made the case that America isn't even a democracy anymore. It's an oligarchy. It, it's basically just run by the wealthy elite. And again, I'm not coming on saying, oh no, how dare they? I, I'm not one of these, like, cause if I did, I'm like, the anger would just, dis I, I dissolve because of just how angry I am. But no, I'm not even going to do that. I'm not going to get angry about it. I'm just observing what is. And I think I'd have to look into it more, but there, I, it seems like there is a case we made that it's not even a democracy anymore. It's an oligarchy. If you're concerned about the capturing of democracy by an ol oligarchical elite, you did have like quite a stark contrast in this election between the world's richest man being like shadow VP for an extremely rich man. Yeah. And then Joe Biden is to be fair from like a relatively working class background. And yeah, but come on, man. like Biden is, if you look at the donors for Biden and then to Harris, the, 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 the donors, donors, sure. But like they are like, neither of those two are like grew up oligarchically, you know, like no. Trump's from a like, okay. Musk is like a self-made man, but he is the richest man in the world. So, if you're, <clears throat> if that is a concern of yours, then I would say that counts against. But, but Kamala cozying up with those wealthy donors, it's not even a concern for me because they were both pretty, like they're both bought by the industries and the. the oh yeah, the, sure. The but like one of them's a bit more transparent than the other, I guess. Like, um, that... I'm not looking forward to Musk being head of like this new uh, department on efficiency because look at. Oh what... man, he's gonna fix it, man. <laughs> Dude, look at what he did to Twitter. He bought yeah, it. Yeah, but some people say Twitter needed like that. Carved, and he's he's carved out the team that works there, so that they can't moderate the content anymore, and it's a bit of a wild west, and can be quite unpleasant at times. I feel like there needs to be a platform that is the wild west. Like I, I feel like there could be platform. I feel like there's space for both. If you you can have your more moderated, more regulated platforms, but you got to have maybe one out there where it's just insane. <laughs> Yeah, but like my point stands. I don't think a lot of the American public want America to be a wild west, you know, in terms of like. But that's America, um, man. That's that. It is the wild west, man. They love their freedom. They love their liberty. They love their guns. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But like, I just don't. I don't really trust Musk to deliver efficiency savings um, in any way that would benefit the ordinary voter. I think it will be like um, shutting down antitrust cases against big tech or it'll be like really slimming down um departments that work on like energy infrastructure or 
um, the climate, things like that. Mm. Um, yeah, just and, doing, uh, having loads of like spiteful, vengeful things um, and cutting them, cutting uh, like government services around that. Which I, I know don't... from some of his interviews that Musk has a big problem with regulation. To, uh, he thinks it just stifles business and innovation. But then, dude, he came out and and like asked for a pause in AI, generative AI research a few months ago, yeah. um, like saying we need regulation. Let's pause everything. And then when that didn't la la landed on deaf ears, he made his own generative AI, AI company. Was it called Grog or something? Um, Grog or Grog? Grog. Yeah. Yeah. He just talks out of both sides of his mouth, dude. Like I, I don't think he's a serious, thoughtful, vision-driven person. I think he's an opportunist. Um, I think he's an opportunist, but I also th I also rate him as a visionary, and this may be where we differ. I I totally get what he's doing, man. Like I totally get that he's he's such an opportunist. Like, he's he's de like so. Well, why is he backing Trump? There's different um. There's different explanations. I think the the Trump's maybe tariffs on China. Because China's making hella cars these days, man. They're out competing everyone, and they're making electric mm. cars cheaper than anyone can. So when t Trump puts tariffs up against Chinese products coming in, that's definitely going to help Elon. So I think Elon's maybe that's maybe one of the reasons why Elon's supporting him. But there's probably others, man. I think a lot of the Biden administration were quite suspicious of Elon, definitely towards the end of that administration. And how much power should one individual have? Elon now is the richest man in the world. Well, maybe the government was going to come after him in some areas. You have someone who seems to me to be potentially a, you know, ha has dark personality traits, you could say, like either sociopathy or, um, or, um, whatever like something and and he's married now with an extremely uh fragilely like egotistical man in trump so he's obviously going to be i would say musk would, could easily have trump around his little finger like on some policy issues i think trump is yeah i think technologically really trump is gonna go to him but i think look i think he might be yeah so sure he might be but Look, this the way I'm looking at it, this is a guy who's given us Tesla, SpaceX, and now X as well. Um, whatever you say about him, he has created some great products. Well, he's, like most people would agree that Twitter's got worse since he bought it. Okay, fine. Um, but, but, and he didn't create it, of course, in the first place. But no. yeah, he, he deregulated. He's hired it. a lot of clever people to build stuff that he could see would be valuable in the future. And that's good. It, it, this is a guy whose whose end goal is to get up to how set up a colony in Mars, man. Like, I I just think he's exciting, man. Like, and I don't think it's all bull because he has accomplished some things. And I just I, look, I welcome him more than I welcome a new Kamala administration. Like, I want to see what he does. I, you said you said it in our last interview, man. You called me and you said you asked whether I was an accelerationist. And since you said that, that word stuck in my mind, and I've gone maybe. Like I just yeah, because I, I I just feel like we need to get out of wherever we are. These the early two thousand twenties for both the UK and the less so for the US than the UK, but for the UK especially, it's been dreadful. And yeah. I'm, th I'm looking at different models now. Like, what can we do to improve the status quo? I'm looking. At so there's obviously the American project with Trump and Elon and them lot, which I'm going to be monitoring very closely. I'm looking at China's model as well, man, which is kind of like a socialist model, um, state run capitalism. But it, China's different, man. It's like in America, you know, the, the politician essentially does what the person in finance, what the person in banking wants them to do, right? In China, it's the other way around. You can be a very successful businessman or whatever, but you, you still subordinate your interest to the state and to the well-being of the collective and the whole. Mm. And for a long time, just to even acknowledge that is like heresy in the West, right? Um, and obviously, there are things about China's model that do concern me. But there are things that make me go, hold on, could we maybe learn something from them? I, I just want to, I'm just curious, man. Like, they're clearly doing something right. Uh, what is it? And can we maybe learn from them? You're, you're talking in terms of, like, both, like, from my perspective, both with Trump and China and stuff, like, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, mm. I don't want to see 
Trump as president, but I can see that his economic policies are more exciting and maybe like of the time than the lack of uh, change or the status quo would have been under uh, Harris. And definitely agree, like China's done some things right, although you wonder if that's like largely to do with the population size and like the the yeah. working conditions and stuff. Like they've been able yeah. to industrialize yeah. in quite a Victorian era kind of way. Uh, um, and obviously yeah. like super authoritarian, which is a society I'd really hate to live in. Yeah, uh, like sure. surveillance and stuff. But you're right, like they'd be like on on a kind of intellectual point, you can definitely I guess you can look at them and go, like, is there any lesson here? I think they yeah. did like they did really amazing work with EVs and solar panels. Like they just mm. the government just like subsidized the fuck out of it. Yeah. And now they have a, the world leading industry in both of those things, which are very like future facing. So that makes you think that like there's a lesson there for all governments. Like why don't you just invest so much in something that's obviously going to be valuable for the next like 50 years. Yeah. Instead of like tinkering with like, oh, let's support the auto industry in Chicago or Illinois because the auto workers unions are upset, you know, like yeah. do something big. Uh, but I still like, I find it hard to be excited about a Trump presidency because it could be, it could be not as dramatic as maybe we hope. Mm. And it could just be quite shit. Well, maybe. that's, you know, so we've got the, the obvious concern revolves around tariffs and how disastrous they can be for the global economy. Um, tariffs are like, you know, the United States, like Britain before it, is essentially a maritime power. It's a country that made its wealth off the backs of doing trade, um, maybe exploiting some countries as well, but really uh, trading its goods and services. Um, and Trump's policies represent a massive shift away from that. It, it there, are t there are things about Trump that are quite FDR-like, actually, uh, in terms of the protectionism. There's mm. things about Trump that could be quite Nixon-like in terms of the detente and the way he might approach China and Russia. I, mean, I, I can't help but I just... I am a bit excited because I want to see what he becomes. And look, I get that it could be atrocious. It could, it, he could be ma a massive disappointment. But it's definitely, we'd, we've definitely entered a new age. We've entered a new age now. And like, I just want to see how it materializes. Um, with Kamala, we wouldn't have entered it. We would have just been, we, we would have been become a corpse of the old age. Like, yeah. On yeah. that, we can really agree. I like the status quo was so boring, a boring and b like crap, like super yeah. rubbish. Yeah. Like, but the, Biden's foreign policy was so weak and ineffectual. Yeah. It's right. like almost embarrassing. Yeah. Um, I I do I did think there was a parallel between like Trump coming in and Nixon because a of like the back channel stuff that mm. Trump having with Putin. Yeah, or, Trump loves you know, back channel, man. Yeah. And then be like that they face that choice of okay, do we invest a load more into this war in order to get a stronger negotiating position for Ukraine? Mm. Or do we just say to Zelensky like sorry mate, but like we want to we want out, so we just want you to have a war that's finished and like have some treaties so that yeah. like not um that's a big choice. I guess he's going to go for the latter. It'd be hard to see him like pushing Congress for like a huge bung for Ukraine. Yeah. If they know that his policy is really to like stop the war. Mm. So, I mean, again, it, it would be a great thing if he achieved an end to that war, I think. Like, yeah, it would be, sure. obviously, it would suck for Ukraine, but there's a part of me that thinks without NATO um, belligerence, like getting involved properly. And it's escalating it. There is no way for Ukraine to to win that territory back. It's just a sad thing. Probably. Yeah, man. I think I think again. I've I've expressed my views on the Ukraine war before, but I really do think that that started with. I, I think that war is it's tragically a product of U.S. arrogance. I think it really is, man. I think they pushed NATO and pushed NATO and pushed NATO to the point where Putin went stop, and they went no. <laughs> and it, that's such a simplistic. Uh, presentation of it, but I really do think that's it's as simple as that. I've said a hundred times, what would Britain do if Russia struck up a military pact with Wales? 
I'm sure England would do the same thing. And yeah. we've seen historically the US would do the same thing. When Russia put missiles in Cuba, the United States did the exact same thing. No, you well, don't. Well, all of South America and all those coups and CIA operations. Right. Like, it's not even like it has to be, what is it? Like how far off the coast is Cuba from Miami? Like maybe 100 miles, maybe less. Yeah, right. Um, it doesn't even have to be that close. It can be somewhere in the same hemisphere. <laughs> and the, yeah, right. the US gets a little bit uh, scared and and jumpy well, that, um, that's the u.s policy oh, yeah i agree with you but I, I really want there to be like a definitive book written that explains the policy towards ukraine before well i guess like in the 2000s and 2010s um because that would also explain like that maidan revolution and mm. the invasion of crimea mm. and like are there western policymakers, maybe people who are in the pentagon and stuff who look back and go, oh man, we fucked up so bad, actually. But dude, like, the, the, dude, I think that? everyone other than America thinks that. Angela Merkel, back in, after 2008, when that famous meeting happened and Putin said, no, don't move NATO another inch forward, basically, you're not having Ukraine. And Angela Merkel goes up to Bush and says, honestly, he, you don't understand this guy. He, he He's serious. He's gonna, he's gonna do something. Stop expanding NATO. And Bush and whoever else after him, they just don't, they don't understand this, man. They think America has infinite capability. They think America can just literally do whatever it wants. Do you think it's driven, though, by... Because it presumably isn't these presidents who necessarily set the policy. It's like your sort of Pentagon neoliberal hawks who might be, like, sort of belligerent in the sense of, like, let's show our dominance mm. over Russia by mm. just crossing their red lines yeah and then like i, th I think it was it, well, it can't have been john mccain because he's dead but it was someone like john mccain who mm. said in the early months of the war like this is amazing for the u.s mm. we don't like we're not losing any u.s citizens to the war or, mm. or uh, like soldiers but we're significantly weakening russia this is like the best thing for u.s strategic policy so there is that kind of school of thought i think in the pentagon which is like yeah sure just you know, basically wiggle your willy about because it's much bigger than you. <laughs> but I mean, the, the thing I mean. is, we get, and so so liberal institutionalists will disagree with me on this. They'll say Russia is a corrupt system and it's led by an autocrat who deserves to be overthrown. And there's some truth to what they say, by the way. I, you know, we do, I, I ardently believe that we in the UK and people in the US do live in a better system. Yes, no, I think in the UK at least, yeah. Um, but you can't deny the fact that Russia's a nuclear power, man. You prod that bear too much. They could use those nukes. And I, I, I'm so surprised. Like, I see articles in The Economist like, advocating for you know backing Ukraine. And if Ukraine attack Russia, we should support Ukraine in whatever way we can by providing them with missiles. I'm yeah. like, you are... Like, maybe I'm the crazy one, but like... These are articles and policies that are ultimately pushing us closer and closer to nuclear conflict. Like, I, I can't believe it. Like, and, you know, I, I was listening to John Bolton. They asked him, like, yeah, but is, are your, is your support for Ukraine not just pushing us closer to nuclear war? And John Bolton goes, yeah, but I don't believe they'll do it. I'm like, how do you know that, man? How, how do you actually know that? I'd love to know how you know that. And if you could convince me, then great. But, I, like, how does this... Is, if, if, like, the US was to acknowledge that and then, like, you know, sue for some sort of peace, you basically have lost the kind of game theory game, right? You've mm -hmm. said, okay, whenever you threaten nukes, we take you seriously, so we back off, which is exactly not what, like, mutual deterrence is supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. So I do think that they're in a bit of a strategic stick there because... I'm also, like you, really worried about escalation in that war. But you can't go like, oh, he, he mentioned nuclear weapons in his speech to the Russian people. We're really scared. Let's just stop giving them money. Yeah. Because he could he could just do that and march over Europe. Not that either of us think that he would. But like, No, but I've got a friend who thinks we should support Ukraine because if we don't, then Putin's going to take Ukraine. And then he's going to take the rest of Europe. He's going to march into Europe and just take the... Because he knows we're weak. I'm like, no, look, I'm not saying... We draw the line, at, but what are my argument is we draw the line at Ukraine. So basically, fine, mm -hmm. like we've overstepped them up. But if you come, <clears throat> if not, and I'm I'm now a Westerner talking to Putin. Like if you come one step closer to us from Ukraine, 
well, then we're going to hit you back, basically. And I'd be willing to employ nukes then, um, but I wouldn't be willing to use nukes um, for Ukraine because I just don't think it's a a crucial geographical entity for us. You got, Ukraine, however you want to look at it, matters so much more to Russia than it does to us because it's got those Carpathian Mountains to the west. And for Russia, who have historically been attacked from the West by Germany, whatever, Britain, United States, World War One, they were as well, man. Napoleon, like, yeah. So many times, Napoleon. So they, they're, they're a very insecure country, especially on that Western border. They feel like they need some geographical boundaries, like some geographical buffers. Um, they have Belarus. Now, with the Estonian and Latvian and Baltic countries there, they're not as concerned because they have some natural some natural frontiers there, I believe, in the form of mountains. So they allowed that. But with Ukraine, if Ukraine goes to NATO, then there's no buffer between NATO and Russia. And for them, and Russia looks, whatever you say about Russia, I get that it has issues. I, I'm so glad I live in the UK and not Russia. But, you know, they, can, they consider themselves, a, if not a great power, then worthy, worthy of some degree of respect and mm -hmm. you know the fact that the united states doesn't do any of doesn't pay any respect to russia and look there will be people who argue it shouldn't because russia's a you know an oligarchy like america surprisingly um which has an an, an economy 120th of america's right um no maybe one tenth of america's um maybe less actually so america shouldn't really respect russia that much maybe but I, by the end of the day, it is a power of nuclear weapons. And that's what makes me a little bit like, don't don't prod this bear too much, basically. Do you think there was ever a chance that, because um, you know, Putin claims, I haven't really checked this, but Putin claims that he submitted an application to join NATO. Mm. Um, do you think there was like, if, if the West and the US had played it differently, that like, you know, basically we would have had a massive, uh, date on and a sort of a changing of the geopolitical situation so that Russia is on, you know, that would complete the pivot to Asia, wouldn't it? Like, yeah, it would, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I wonder if like the strategic cock up is much bigger than Ukraine. It's actually like, why didn't we consider like, just stopping having that enemy? Like, so all of those policymakers were probably, you know, like 60s and 70s, the big wigs in the Pentagon could live through the entire Cold War and probably were quite found it quite difficult to consider Russia an ally. But maybe they should I'd have. I'd love maybe to know more easy. about that. I, I'm like, to what extent was Putin genuine? To what extent was Putin himself genuine about that? Was he just saying it so that he could have something for the record later on? I, I, I find it very difficult to believe that Putin would ever really want to join NATO. You know, I think Putin is a... I, I sense him to be a neo imperialist. Like, I think he likes the idea of a great Russia with its own sphere of influence. You know, why else does he have Belarus under his finger? You know, and why else does he want Ukraine? Why, I mean, why else would he want Ukraine? Because there was evidence that he was trying to build a Eurasian economic union before all of this stuff. And he, for him, Ukraine was a big part of that. Now, Ukraine never. Oh, the rest of the Eura Eurasia is pretty much up for grabs and quite compliant, as far as I can see. So, like, I don't think, no, if it would, I guess he gets everything he wants out of the EU in the sense, sense of like EU buys all of the energy resources. Mm. So it's not like a closer union would be that uh, no. attractive. No. I don't know. It might, it might just be nice to like, you know, retrain all of those uh, nuclear missiles onto China. <laughs> from Russia. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. Can you imagine uh, Russia East. and America teaming up? That would be insane. If the, if the USA did turn him away, then why? I, I have no idea because surely that, you know, there was this time during the 90s when the US and the Russia seemed to be getting along a little bit better, um, even if it is always the United States benefiting more from the relationship than Russia. So, yeah, I, I, it's really something I'd need to look into more. I guess uh, there's a lot of pride there. I, I was meant to show you this book. Yeah, I was about to mention a book I'm reading as well. But, oh, so uh, Bob Woodward, man, my guy, man. And then you you got all the usual suspects. Yeah. On the front cover here. Oh, is that a new one? 
Uh, yeah, it's pretty new. I think it was it's earlier this year. Dude, funnily enough, yeah, it's 2024. Ima- like, imagine how small Kamala's footnote is in history. Like, yeah, <laughs> she's yeah. just going to go into obscurity. No chance she's the next nominee. And no. yeah, she gets a little square on this front cover. Man, mm. that's that's as big a square as she's going to get for me. So Yeah. <laughs> like for, for all we know, she could come back in four years and be like the greatest candidate ever. But like, <laughs> seems unlikely. Yeah, I really think she should have just like, she should have talked to, to Biden and said, "Look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw you under the bus," because I think I need to. I think that would have been, and then, and then, like, set out a policy platform that's like, I know people are dissatisfied. I've been dissatisfied as vice president. Yeah. I tried to apply my my influence, but now I have an opportunity to put in place my policies. Then it would be exciting. You were talking earlier about excitement. Yeah, right. I've, you know, excitement. There are people who actually say that she did actually stand for some things before this election. You know, she was actually someone who was more left wing than we actually saw. Uh, mm. she, obviously, she stood for obviously the abortion thing, which was kind of cool. Uh, that was something I myself supported. But she, it's like her whole campaign was just about that. <laughs> and and I, I feel like the, 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 the fundamental thing, it's quite hard to like find the right words for, but I do find the Democrats to be quite like on their high horse. Yeah. And making issues into like an existential threat yeah. when I don't find that discourse, at least as a Brit, very persuasive at all. No. Because I feel like we like kind of more level-headed, reason reasonable arguments. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it actually washed with her. Like the Democratic coalition didn't mm-hmm. seem to wash wash with like um, Latino men and black men as as much as Biden uh, did in terms of the votes they got. She got so mm-hmm. the the coalition just broke down in the face of a load of waffle. Yeah. And no substance. And I think, yeah. like, looking back, it seems so fucking obvious. But honestly, at the time, I thought it was going to be neck and neck. And I thought we wouldn't get results for a week or two. I so. thought, did you? I From two weeks before it, I said Trump was going to win. And now I'm not claiming to be some kind of force, like, being able to see the future or anything. But two weeks before, I was like, no, nah, he's definitely going to win. And the polls were so wrong, mate, weren't they, really? Like, they, yeah. were, they were way off. Mate, like, this is the thing. Like, what I, I showed, I think I've showed you. I don't know if I showed you the graph. Um, of Neil Ferguson had some graphs showing how weak um public faith in uh the me in all of the America's institutions are. But the one that really struck out for me was the media. I'm just gonna see if I can find it right now. Fourteen percent have faith in the news. Eleven percent. Oh no! So all time low is eleven percent which was 2022. In 2023, it's only 3% better. 14% of Americans have any faith in the mainstream media, which is is insane. And that's that's just one of the institutions that Americans have lost faith in. There are so many that they've lost confidence in. Um, Would you say that's got a lot to do, though, with like how partisan the TV is? So like, if you were a Democrat, you'd watch CNN or, or NBC or something. Yeah. If you're a Republican, you watch Fox. But you yeah. hate the other network. So there's a part of you that just hates the media or would answer that question negatively because you know that Fox exists if you're a Democrat, mm. you know that CNN exists if you're a Republican. Or is it that like across the board, they're just like, this has got really crap. I don't I don't know like what. what well, that's a like. really great question. And that would be the next level of analysis, which I'm going to be honest, I haven't gone into. I kind of just made this, um, I kind of based on my own personal experience, which was, you know, I, I myself feel very disillusioned. I've turned a lot more to alternative. I think many people, our generation have turned to alternative media a lot more, you know, whereas our parents will still watch the BBC or in America, CNN or so on. Um, I think our generation are more on TikTok or YouTube. We have our favorite influences. And I think it's important to remind ourselves to still try and stay balanced. You know, I I listen to thinkers on the left and on the right now on my YouTube, and I intend to keep it that way. I think going too far to any extreme um, could be quite problematic. There's this guy called, uh, I don't know if you watch him, he's called Geopolitical Economic Report or something. He's super left-wing, man. He's so left-wing. But 
he do, he he does his research. He's, he he shows some brilliant graphs and some brilliant statistics, and I listen to him because of that. But you know, something I realized the other day, I feel like the the substance of our disagreements is probably mostly down to like the the media that we consume. You and I, I mean, maybe like. Um, I mean, it's based on what's the information we get, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And like, I do read more left, read and watch more left wing commentators and news sources than you. Yeah, yeah. I also try and do the same as you. Like, I, I, I try and see what's going on in the, uh, in the on the right, and I appreciate. Like, I, I really do. I don't write people off. I'm interested to see what ideas they have. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, like. Uh, my worldview is just shaped by my media diet so much. Yeah, I always feel like I don't have like independent beliefs. <laughs> like it's just, they, I'm so flexible depending on like just the algorithm and like mm. um, if I like for instance, I recently read a really interesting piece by Peter Hitchens, who's okay for sure on the kind of conservative uh, right about like sort of he was basically an anti-abortion um essay and i was like fucking hell like you know what i never even thought about abortion that much i was just like gonna be pro-abortion because that seems what women want and stuff yeah it's not like i'm now anti-abortion but it did open my mind up to like even even this issue which seemed so clear-cut to me all you have to hear is one decent well put together argument on the other side and suddenly you're just in the gray area again yeah right I feel like i'm constantly just bit like i'm like a ship in a storm i don't I don't have an anchor point with like strong ideological beliefs because of that, like of that attempt to hear both sides. Maybe you can identify with that. I feel like you're, you're even. I, less I definitely, I think, you know what? The last year I've become a little firmer in some views. I think this time last year, I was exactly where you are, which makes sense. Cause you are one year younger than me, but you know, I think, um, no, I think this year I'm a little bit set, more set in some areas. Um, but even that, I'm I'm set in them until I'm proven wrong, kind of thing. You know, I'm. You know, it's not so much that I'm set; it's that I'm willing to bet on things. That's what. That's the what I'm willing to say. You know, I think you do have some, sorry, like, go on. you do have some. I don't know if they're ideological foundations or yeah it's like you have some foundational ideas that like whenever i talk to you or try and convince you of like a socialist argument i feel like you're like okay you're making some logical sense but then you always say like but i don't think that's human how humanity works like i i want to live in a world where like people strive and it's dirty and it's a dog fight and like i feel like we that's we're opposed there because i feel like humanity can be a lot um a lot kinder and more collaborative and i feel like you I think you know that. Petition. Actually, funny enough, Francis Francis Fukuyama wrote a piece in the FT. Yeah, yeah. I haven't read it yet because I don't have access. But did you read it? I did. I've already forgotten what he said. I mean, he's already chucked his theory years ago. But I saw another I meme. Actually, it was like it was making fun of the end of history. It was like the end of history trying to say something, and then history embodied in someone saying, "You sit down now, Francis." <laughs> <laughs> So naive. I yeah, mean, yeah. But, uh, I would be interested to see what he's how he looks at this because, um, well, I mean, he hates power. Trump. He absolutely loves. He's. Uh, they asked him. I think it was on. I can't remember what it was on. I think it was on average. Uh, not average Joe. The Joe Pol Joe politics or something. Um, which and someone asked him who is the worst president of all time, and Francis Fukuyama said, "Oh yeah, Donald Trump, without even question." He said, he, "Of all the presidents, he knows Trump is the worst." Um, and I think from his angle, you could understand that, you know, Francis Fukuyama is the neoliberal poster boy in academia, right? I think Trump represents a break from that more so than any president in living memory. So yeah. it makes sense why he sees him that way. Obviously, if you go to someone like Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro hates Obama and loves Trump. It's totally the opposite with him. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, but I, I can't. I'd love to. Yeah, recall what Fukuyama. It's crazy because I'm End of History was. I loved End of History as a book, as a scientific political science book. I loved reading it. It was mm. so eye opening. Um, but recently, Fukuyama's just because of maybe what's happening, he's been disappointing. I I bought his latest book, which was Liberalism and Its Discontents, <laughs> and I can't remember a single thing from that book. 
it, it made zero impression on me. And I think Fukuyama really is just a product of his time now. Like, I think he'll always have a place in my heart for the end of history. And I, and I, I think even some of his ideas are good. Some of his ideas are true. And I, I, why he makes he still makes the odd good point, man. You know, he's, we, he, when asked him, uh, he was on, he was debating that other guy. You, I think you watched it. He was debating that philosopher guy. Oh yeah, yeah, I did watch him. And the guy asked, and he was like, and the guy's like, well, do you think your whole worldview for Fukuyama is basically coming to an end? Is it not moribund? And Fukuyama's like, yeah, but look at all these places, all these countries that aren't the West. Whenever someone runs away from their country, whenever they immigrate away from their country, they always come to the West, man. They always want to come to these countries. And he said, why is that? And he, he believes it's something to do with our liberal system. And I, from my, and making about personal experience again, my parents did the same thing. They came to the UK because it had the better system, man. So there is some truth in what he says. And th th there is this part of me that is sympathetic to the li liberal institutional worldview. But I think it's not the be all and end all. I think politicians, mm. like, like, and especially it's come at a cost of the majorities in these nation states who feel like they've lost out. So I think maybe Fukuyama's analysis was not without credit. And I think it will have some universal and timeless um, credit, but it's not the be all and end all. And I think we've entered a new era. And what yeah. this new era is, it's it's too early to say, isn't it? But I'm excited. It is, but then I feel like there are signs of it. I read this great book called Four Futures. I mentioned it to you before. And it yeah. was like looking at different global movements and trying to put them into a quadrant. Right. And then naming each quadrant. I can't really um, recall all of them right now, but one of them was basically hypercapitalization, um, isolationism uh, within that, and then like very, very strict border control. Mm. Uh, like, and we're seeing those things, I said, would say, like, I think what Trump does with tariffs is going to be like the most significant thing he does in his first year. I read a good article that explained that even for a dumb person like me, economics wise, if you oh. put twenty percent tariff on a um, on a Chinese EV, they will have overproduced because they'll have expected to sell a certain amount to the US or the, or maybe even like the American Hemisphere, uh, which now they're struggling to get in. So they'll just dump a load of EVs in the EU market for even cheaper than they go now, which will spur the EU to put tariffs up too because the EU's got its own car production um wow you know, manufacturing base so they'll be have to be like no okay we need to now enter this trade war and that's how you get a trade war and and then all you have is isolationism and how does a trade war thaw like it feels like a kind of a, a, a compounding spiral and that would be really weird because the eu is not supposed to be like the eu's like founded on this like openness to some extent but then you look at the eu border control right now with like lots more severe policies towards people crossing the mediterranean so I think overall, we're heading in that kind of quite like, almost dystopian direction um, of protectionism. And you know who it's really, really crap for? The UK, because we just like, we exited, we Brexited on the basis of like free go global trade and like, you know, striking a huge trade deal with Canada and the US. And now if they're putting tariffs up and there's going to be a global trade war, we're so screwed. <laughs> yeah. We're even more screwed than we are now. Right, uh, but, that's terrifying. but I, yeah, again, I, I, I have yet to learn more about this. Economics is my major this year. I'm learning everything I can about economics because I feel yeah, like yeah. please pass it on because I'm so in dark and it's so important, isn't it? Yeah, but I feel like we both we could both because I think we it's, our, <laughs> it's the last piece of the puzzle for both of us, maybe because we both know a lot about geopolitics, we both know a lot about the media, uh, we know about lo lots of things. I feel like if we just nail this last one, man, like... We'd be like the perfect um, sort of James Milner, not, not very good at anything, but like got the full package, utility yeah. armchair <laughs> commentators. Yeah. yeah, you're right, though. I definitely feel that way, but like it's really hard to get your head around like, how all this works. It was just put like that tariff thing with EVs was put in such a simple way that it just like made a load of sense. Well, I was going to ask, do you, th do you think it's going to actually have the domino effect, the knock-on effect that it, it may? I mean, there may be some countries that say no and keep open, maybe? Or 
insist on doing trade? Like, I, I, I'm so in the dark in this. <laughs> I guess with EVs, like, so Europe has like a decent um, car industry, right? Like, Europe right. exports a load of places because a lot of its cars are like on that, like, not quite premium. I guess they are premium cars, to be fair. If you look at yeah. like even BMW and Mercedes go really expensive. Um, for sure, those companies are not going to want. Um, like ch cheap Chinese cars entering the market because they will just not be able to compete at all. Mm. Um, so you expect a really strong and like one of the most powerful lobbies in the EU to be like, we need to do tariffs too. I would be surprised if the EU didn't. Um, and also Trump was saying the whole thing about Europe not buying American stuff. Mm. Dear, did you see that commentary? And he was like, they don't buy our food. And I was like, I know, that's so good. <laughs> like going back to you saying about like gaining weight. I don't want the fucking chlorinated chicken that looks like a fish. <laughs> like I'm fine with the meat that we produce here. Yeah. I, I, I do not want, like what would we even want to buy from the US realistically apart from like sort of raw materials perhaps? Um, the America's, oh mate, I've, I can't wait to create a bit to I'll tell you about super imperialism and, and um and maybe release a video on this book called Super Imperialism because it, it outlines the entire American strategy from World War One to the 1970s when it left the gold standard. It's really fascinating, man. It's such a fascinating read. Um, is it accessible? Would you say, no. or is it quite heavy? <laughs> it's very. Yeah, that's the. That's the problem. It's very heavy. I'm having to do a foundation. I'm ha I had to pick up this foundation level economics textbook, and I'm going to read through this and then go back to the this super imperialism book because it is heavy. But I I have gotten some things from it. I've gotten enough mm. to talk about it in a casual way. Um, so. The story begins with World War One, right? And Europe goes to war with Germany, and Germany is beating the crap out of Britain and France. I, I don't get where we we always get so proud, like proud about being Germany in two world wars and stuff. But look, look, Ger but it took the whole world to take out Germany, man. I've got so much respect, not for Germany and the Nazis and stuff, but just how much of a powerhouse Germany has. Yeah, that, the war been. machine was intense. Yeah, like you got to give them some credit, man um so Ger germany's being the crap out of france and britain and so france and britain go up to america and ask for loans and america in the 30 years before this had started to really come up and become a rich and powerful country and so their bankers give the europeans the loans but then when britain and france keep losing and keep losing well then the bankers get very uh, worried that they're not going to get their returns and so Woodrow Wilson orders America to get involved just to help the financiers. Apparently, this is the narrative of Hudson's super imperialist book. OK, this is mm. his narrative. Uh, and so America before, gets before you go on. Is that quite like, is it contested very strongly or is it? I don't know. Strong? But look, there's so much we hear it time and time again, man. We hear about the First World War being a capitalist war, an imperialist war. We hear it from Lenin, from Hitler, from all these people. And sure, mm. Lenin and Hitler are very problematic characters, but it, it, there's no s smoke without fire, right? Like, maybe there is something to this, okay? Mm. And, and uh, Hudson's a very respected hist economic historian as well. So, again, I I'd need to read more before I could con absolutely confirm it. Because always there's always a different side to the story, right? There are different angles. What about the political dimension and so on? Sure. But yes, yeah, so this is the case that Hudson makes, right? And so America gets involved. They send their soldiers in. Uh, they get they run a whole propaganda campaign initiated by George Creel and Edward Bernays, who my next story is coming out on. So check it out when it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, um. And then so they start getting when the war ends and Britain and France defeat Germany. The first question Woodrow Wilson asks is, yeah, so how are you going to pay us back? <laughs> and Britain and France are like, yeah, but we don't have any money. We just spent it all on fighting Germany. And America's like, yeah, but that's not really our concern, is it? And so rather than take it easy on the Europeans, they're like they keep pressing Britain and France. Yeah, give us our money. Give us our money. And so Britain and France squeeze Germany and get the money from Germany. 
uh, and start paying America back. And America has the time of its life in the 20s when it's just reaping all the profits back from the yeah. wartime investment, the debts that, that the Europeans have accumulated, the weapons they sold. All of this money that they loaned is just coming back and America has its golden age of the roaring 20s. And meanwhile, you've got some fascist movements coming up in Europe being like, what the hell? <laughs> like, yeah. what? Why are we so indebted to America? Where would all that money go that we stole from our colonies? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. How dare yeah. they? <laughs> the, the, the world is ours to co take control of, not America's. Um, and so come 1929, when America crashes, it's not just America that loses out, it's Europe as well, because... Um, you know, they'd been loaning America all the money back. I'd have to go into more detail about how that works. But when America sneezes, the world catches a cold, basically, in 1929. And again, Hubert Humphrey, Hubert, Hubert, Hubert Humphrey, Humphrey, <laughs> Hoover, President Hoover, <laughs> Hoover, the, the, the Hoover, Hoover was in charge. And Hoover goes, right, well, we've messed up. Um, we need to make our money back. Um, but you know, Britain and France and all those European countries, Germany, they're all struggling as much as we are. We can't seriously expect them to keep paying our loans back at the same rate they used to. But then Roosevelt comes in and goes, no, we need to be just as hard on the Europeans, if not harder. If they need to liquidate their assets, if they need to sell their assets off to us, then so be it. We're going to do that. Roosevelt yeah. is much harder on Europe than Hoover was going to be. And so Roosevelt comes into power and that's exactly what he does. He's as hard on Europe as, as anyone. Um, and again, Roosevelt puts in protectionism. He, prior, he does America first before Trump does it. Um, and again, you see the 1930s is another very difficult period for Europeans. Now Hitler comes up and does his own thing and that's a bit of a problem. But then I've heard people say how America was actually willing to let Hitler to get, away, get quite bold and quite warmongery because again... Another way they could capitalize from it was loaning Europe, you're loaning Britain and France money, making returns on interest, selling them weapons and all this. Um, and again, that has yet to be, I, I have yet to prove that. This is just one thing I heard from a podcast that it was actually Roosevelt's plan to allow that to happen. And so come the end of World War II, Britain and France were officially finished. Like they've spent the last of their money defending themselves from the Nazis. Um, taking loans from america again and america emerges so much more powerful than it's ever been come the end of world war ii america has 50 percent of the world's gdp more than that by come by 19 late 40s they have 57 percent which mm. is insane um and america basically as we'll take it from here um and they set up the global institutions Bretton woods imf world bank all these institutions that basically this is the pivotal moment where America sets up the world in such a way that it they re, their economies revolve around America's interest. We talk about America embracing free trade and all this stuff, right? Being a very setting up a free market. Hudson argues that it was nothing like that. Yeah. America went up to different countries and said, right, well, you're going to make your economy this way so that it benefits us. So, for example, a lot of countries at the end of World War II had a lot of grain they could have produced their own food they could have exported their own food america goes no 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 we'll take care of that you're gonna buy grain from us <laughs> and a lot of the world's like but we don't need grain from you we can develop that ourselves and america goes no 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 you're gonna buy grain from us and if you don't well we'll just the whole economic system will collapse basically and we'll stop investing in you um and this is the bit I struggle a bit most with because at some point they could no longer do that. Um, but what, okay. And this is the most groundbreaking insight from the entire book. Okay. So when the Korean war happens in 1950 to 53, America enters debt for the first time. It starts, but what I mean by that is it starts um, importing more than it's exporting. Okay. Mm. It enters a deficit. And America goes, well, oh, crap, we're just becoming the next Britain. We're already going to become a declining power at this rate. And so what they do is they say to all these countries, right, well, we'll buy things from you guys. We'll import 
products from all of you guys, Asia, Africa, wherever. We'll, we'll, we'll keep importing things from you and we'll keep entering a deficit. But with the dollars we give to you for your goods, you keep those dollars. And then your central banks can reinvest those dollars into our treasury and our shares. And as we grow, as, as you invest those dollars, you will eventually pay you back on interest when we eventually grow. And this becomes a self-perpetuating cycle in which America is constantly going into deficit by buying more from the rest of the world. But the rest of the world accepts the U.S. dollar because the U.S. dollar is so valuable and they keep reinvesting that dollar into the U.S., so the U.S. keeps growing and growing and growing. And so basically America's got cheated the system. It's basically created a system in which countries can't afford to not invest in it. America can keep going off and fighting all kinds of wars and it can keep getting countries to fund its wars. And these countries can't pull away from it because the dollar is so valuable. And again, I'm sure this could do with some better explanation. But this system keeps going until 71 when Nixon uh, uh, leaves the dollar, and I don't really know what happens after that. I'm, but, but apparently that's one of the most significant moments in the 20th century. Leaves the gold standard, you mean? When he leaves the gold standard, yeah. <clears throat> mm. Yeah. Um, and, and then it's like fiat currency from that point. Yeah, which, again, I've, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> but like, I mean, establishing the, the dollar as the global currency is, is already going to help you have dollars spent in your country. It's mm. interesting because you see a lot of like in the last 20 years, it will be like, oh, Myanmar or Bangladesh or Tunisia or Venezuela has sunken into debt. And now the IMF has landed in, uh, you know, in Yangon and they're going to uh, find a rescue package. Like, thank God the IMF have rode into town. But yeah. the IMF is not like super independent. The IMF is as you say is skewed and then you see these reports from like i would say more left-wing outlets saying the imf are just out to shaft this country mm. they're not out to repair the economy they're out to like build build in austerity and poverty that's going to lead to loads of excess deaths but will make it an open market for the us mm. and like, that alone will make that economy like you know it will start it up a bit but at a huge expense for the people yeah and you can understand why um You've got organizations like the BRICS starting to come up as well now, man. Um, I think that it's a, it's a repudiation of the Western-led order. I think they're, they've are they got their own investment bank. I think they just want to do things their own way now. I really back those things, dude. And yeah. like going back to Fukuyama, I mean, in a really fucking macro sense, which is going to just sound naive, and it is naive because I am naive, but like, I feel like the States had the world in its hands. And didn't know what to do with it and basically fucked up yeah like like they became extremely powerful and very threatening and dominant but at the expense of the ideals that might have won the hearts and minds yeah and sure. I feel like they've Absolutely. lost the hearts and minds of so many massive regions yeah like I, even um i was in sri lanka when the war kicked off in ukraine right no one there was sympathetic to ukraine they like they just had a different information diet. They were like, "Well, yeah, like what do you expect Putin to do?" And I was like watching the news, like this is insane, like new war in Europe. This is fucked. Fuck Putin. And it, like you know, so Sri Lanka, like sort of not a significant country uh, in the sense of geopolitics, but not kowtowing to um, the American party line at all. Nowhere in the Middle East is doing so. Nowhere in Eurasia. Nowhere that the US has had a war any time recently. India is a really sceptical country towards the US. Obviously China. Loads of Africa. All of the previously non-aligned countries are basically aligning themselves against the US. Yeah, man. Um, I think a lot like of them even prefer doing business with China. Because I think historically, whenever... Not always. It depends on how useful you are. But I think for a lot of countries who weren't maybe as useful as others, America would say, yeah, we'll help you, but you better democratize your system. <laughs> I think with China, yeah, right. they don't Screams freaking care. <laughs> yeah. China's like, oh, you've got a dictator. Okay, he can stay. <laughs> He'll have yeah, some China's money. like, we want your cobalt, please, to make our yeah. batteries. Um, yeah. We'll build you a port or something, and then yeah. can we have the cobalt? At least it's like quid pro quo, you know? Yeah. Um, it's not like they're not selling a dream. 
yeah. And if you sell a dream and don't deliver on it, then people are going to get disillusioned, which I think is what's happened. It was part of the US. Well, I said it in an earlier video. I think the US, I was, I, they, the, what they did better than Britain was, I think at first, at least, they marketed themselves better. I think there was a time when people genuinely believed in the American dream and uh, America's dream. vision for the world, um, a world of free markets and free enterprise. And that's inspiring. But I think with in today's world of social media and online free, freedom of information we've seen from online media, I think everyone just knows that that was BS. Um, and I mean, I think more and more people are waking up to just how BS that was. Yeah, I think I think that you could you have to say like counter government narratives have a lot more airtime, and we have access to a lot more information. Yeah, um, it's like the Vietnam effect with like having journalists and stuff over there really like started that counterculture movement. Yeah, but now it's like an hyperdrive. Like you can call into question any any of these like founding beliefs of the US and just say, yeah. well, why are you doing that then? Yeah. If you support democracy, why are you overthrowing a democratically elected leader? Yeah. Uh, in, Chile, in... Guatemala, Iran. I get that there was the national interest involved in these places. I get that they had business interests to guard, but it still does put their values in, in it does compromise their vision and values. It's just hypocritical. Like, like, yeah, yeah. You can't lean heavily on something like that that's hypocritical. Yeah. And then, yeah, I guess um, Mir Shaima says, that Iraq and Afghanistan was like the final uh, nail in the coffin for that kind of thing because there just was such a clusterfuck. Yeah. Um, which is interesting in itself, I guess.